Hello everybody, hope you're all doing well. My name is Steven and this is the Storytime channel. Without wasting any time, let's get into our stories of the day. Our first story is by Truth is Life 13, Medical Care Provided by the Garbage Man. I finished my PhD in the middle of a terrible recession and I was having a hard time finding a permanent job. I stayed afloat financially by adjunct teaching, low pay, no benefits and by doing whatever odd jobs I could find. I was a volunteer EMT at the time, and a friend was able to get me a night shift job in a local hospital as an IV technician. Strictly speaking, that should have been a job for licensed nurses, so I suspect the hospital was violating some laws by having EMTs do that, but we were very cheap labor. The nursing staff made it abundantly clear that they thought the EMTs were uneducated halfwits. Two suggested that I try to get an associate's degree to better myself, and that we were utterly beneath contempt. We were completely at the mercy of the charge nurses, and all they ever wanted us to do was take out the garbage and clean up patients after their diapers had exploded. How did you manage to get it on the ceiling? Contrary to what the job description implied, it was actually very rare for us to be asked to start an IV line on anyone and even then it was usually for combative or belligerent patients. One time I was asked to start a line on a woman, and the second I stepped in the door she bellowed, I only want someone who does it professionally. I had enough practice with that sort of thing from my volunteer work that I could have threaded a needle on a roller coaster ride, and I calmly assured her I could manage it without difficulty. Reluctantly, she let me take her hand and I was able to get the line in quickly and painlessly. As soon as I returned to the nursing station, the charge nurse snarled at me, Empty the garbage from the patient rooms. I asked if I could at least wait until the patients were asleep so the patient I just started the line on wouldn't erupt, but she wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise. So I did exactly as I was asked. Predictably, the woman I had just started the line on saw me with the trash bin and she started screaming. They had the garbage man start my IV? What kind of freaking hospital is this? Postscript. As the early morning approached, I went to the lobby where the janitorial staff was gathering. I quickly picked up on the fact that they all had chips on their shoulders and they felt like they were being treated like lower life forms. And I, from my own experiences, I knew they were absolutely right. So to this day, I make a point of being absolutely respectful of everyone, no matter how lowly of a job they seem to have, and to help them out if I can. That has actually paid off a lot of unexpected dividends as the janitors have proven to have the most accurate gossip network. It seems the executives think the janitors are invisible and the execs say a lot of sensitive things when they're around and my corporate spies just love passing the information to me. To be fair, that's pretty funny. (laughs) Imagine you're in the hospital for some procedure or you're getting some procedure done just quickly anyways, and then this person comes in and then they reassure you they'll get the job done, they know how to do it and everything's all fine and dandy, and then they come back in and they start taking the trash out. Oh, hey nurse, could you blah, blah, blah? The person who you think is a nurse turns around. Oh, no, uh, I'm the janitor. Our next story is posted by Xenobius, Paranoid and abusive customer swallows his own medicine. I used to work as a junior admin for a medium-sized web hosting company. The actual job title went a little bit different, but junior admin is essentially what the work amounted to. The team I worked for is a sort of white gloves, premium managed hosting service with a fairly steep monthly cost intended to provide hosting support to mostly medium businesses that were paying for fairly high-powered VPS or dedicated servers, or several. On my first day on the team, I had my first interaction with one of our regular callers we'll just call Dan. Dan is extremely paranoid about his server security and virtually everything running on his server is completely customized with third-party software we do not provide support for. I later found out that everyone else on the team intentionally avoided picking up Dan's chats and letting me walk into that interaction with Dan blindly as a sort of welcome to the team hazing ritual. When you initiate a support contact, be it via support ticket, chat or phone, you have to provide either a password, 
pre-generated access hash or passphrase set up by the account owner before providing support and disclosing potentially sensitive customer information. Any one of these three methods would serve to verify account ownership and allow full access to the account, including making additional purchases, canceling services, and pretty much anything else. This was not secure enough for Dan. Dan insisted that before any support is rendered, two of these methods have to be provided. As company policy only calls for one, Dan's preferences were simply annotated as a sticky note on the account which is easy to miss. In my first interaction with Dan, he voluntarily provided only one of the verification methods and after verifying it checks out, I began addressing his support issue. Dan flies off the handle and loses his shoot because I did not prompt him for a second verification method and launches into a really long and drawn out lecture on keeping his account secure. He eventually calmed down enough to let me do my job and provide him with support. Fast forward a few months and more than a few additional interactions with Dan, raising support tickets for asinine questions like, who owns this IP address that shows us having been blocked in my firewall logs? I demand a full security sweep of my server to make sure it wasn't compromised. I see that Dan shows up as waiting in the chat queue and groan to myself. The only other admin that worked that night was on lunch and I was scheduled to go on lunch right as he gets back. Not only is interacting with Dan a complete nightmare, he also takes forever to get to the point and it looked like lunch wasn't going to happen anytime soon. I accept the chat. The user provides the first verification method and dutifully I asked for a second verification method, not about to be yelled at a second time by Dan. The second verification method checks out too. I ask how can I help and the person on the other end goes, this isn't Dan, I'm his developer. Dan hasn't paid me for my work, so I want you to delete everything on the server. Working in this industry, I've come in contact with more than a few attempts of social engineering and was completely taken aback by this guy's candor. He clearly knew our company policies and knew that as long as the caller was able to verify the account and provide the necessary credentials, we would be forced to comply with their request. I quickly performed an external backup of all of Dan's files. The person on chat did not ask me to delete backups, nor did he ask me to not take any, and deleted all of the site files, effectively taking down Dan's website. I will admit, this felt extremely satisfying and taking a backup of Dan's stuff was a courtesy that I did not have to perform, given the circumstances, but knew my life would not be made easier if I hadn't done so. 20 minutes go by and I'm keeping my eye on the queue, entirely forgetting about lunch at this point. I knew Dan would call any minute now and that I would not be able to dodge his calls at this point. Sure enough, Dan's call, no chat this time, comes in. From the moment I pick up the phone, Dan is screaming in my ear about getting hacked and how insecure our infrastructure was. It takes another 10 minutes for him to calm down enough to provide both methods of verification. Before verification, I was not able to provide any account information as per policy. Once he was verified, he demanded to know what happened to his website and with a calm I didn't really feel, I told him, that was me. I deleted your site, Dan. Your developer started a chat and was able to provide both of the verification methods on your account, confirming account ownership. As per policy, this provides him with full access rights and we were obligated to comply with the requests. This is not the kind of access a security-minded individual such as yourself should have given out to a developer you stiffed on his bill. I told them that I slightly bent the rules for him and took a completely random courtesy backup of his files right before the request to delete the site files came in. Few minutes later, I've got Dan's site backup and running. No idea if he ever ended up paying his developer, but we changed his access credentials and passphrase at the end of the call and Dan became a lot easier to work with from that day forth. Honestly, I think the main thing that frustrates me in this story is that the developer most likely did not get paid for their services that they rendered, which is a very prevalent problem in the online world. 
There's been a number of times online where I've seen cases where developers or web designers don't get paid for their work and they still have access to the back end of the website and I've seen them kind of justifiably take the website hostage in a way where they'll turn the whole website into a blank color with bold text that just says pay your developers or something like that. I just hope in the end the developer did get their money, but it sounds like they probably didn't. Our next story is by Tiny Alien. Don't add seasoning? Okay. Mobile, sorry for formatting. A few notes. I've always had a rough relationship with my mother and she and I also see very differently when it comes to seasoning food. My dad is St. Lucian and he taught my brothers and I to season food like our lives depends on it. My mother, on the other hand, slaps chicken onto a pan and throws it into the oven and then yells at us when we try to season it. I have been vegetarian since I was in 6th grade and I just graduated high school and I still cringe when I see her cook. We never eat as a family. I love mashed potatoes and I love potatoes in general. They can make anything and everything and they're yummy. I was craving some mashed potatoes two days ago and decided to make enough of the box kind for my entire family. While I was mixing the ingredients together and went to grab for the salt, my mother yelled at me saying it's already pre-seasoned. I tried to explain to her that this is the one you add the seasoning yourself to and not the lightly salted one. Mind you, she complained that one had too much seasoning still. She told me to not add seasoning or don't make it. So I made it. No seasoning, nothing. Didn't add my homemade seasoning. No salt, no pepper, nada. I finished it, put the amount I wanted in the bowl, snuck in all the seasoning I wanted before telling everyone there's mashed potatoes on the counter. She's the first one out and I'm sitting at the table waiting. She puts a bunch on her plate and grabbed a spoonful. She has this face of pure confusion. She asked me which box I used and I told her the unseasoned one. She then asks why I didn't add a little bit of salt. I told her that she told me not to add seasoning or I couldn't make it. She didn't really give a response and added a bit of salt and walked back to her room to eat it. I found it super satisfying but it's not as extravagant or as explosive as others so I'm sorry about that. I don't ever season anything, the only seasoning I ever do is salt. I'll add a bunch of salt to stuff. What about you guys, are you all up on seasoning and spices and whatnot? Let me know in the comments below. Because for me, personally, in the seasoning and spices game, I've got a lot to learn. Our next story is by Record 55 Teamwork makes the dream work. Malicious compliance with a tag team from the manager. So I was reminded of this post by another post I saw earlier about debt collectors. Basically, I work in a call center for a fairly large not-for-profit. We get calls all the time from debt collectors looking for people and normally the interaction below plays out in which we politely tell them to freak off. Debt collector says, can I speak to X? What is it in regards to? It's a personal business matter. Translation, they owe us money, they almost always say this. Sorry, regardless of whether X is with us or not, we have a policy of not getting involved in personal business matters. I will be unable to transfer your call or leave a message. Anything else I can help with? No, that'll be all. And call. However, sometimes they do try to push back. And our rule here is simply, if they push, don't move. And we are more than happy to comply. Management included. Hello, can I speak to X? What is it in regards to? Doesn't matter, are they there or not? If you are unable to tell me what it is in regards to, sir, I am unable to assist you any further. Is there anyone else I can talk to? Not unless you can tell me the purpose of your call, sir. Alright, well then give me your manager so I can talk to them about your attitude. Certainly, sir. Please hold the line. I call my manager over and tell them there is a complaint about me. My manager says, Hello, this is Y. I'm OP's manager. How can I help you? Your staff member has been incredibly rude and unhelpful. I'm shocked at how poorly you are training your staff. My apologies for that, sir. I will be sure to have a word with him after this call. May I help with your initial inquiry? Yes, please. Can I speak with X? Manager, now realizing what this is, what is it in regards to? As I said before, that doesn't matter. Now are you going to do your job and put me through or not? 
I'm going to do my job and not. Is there anything else we can help with? Dead collector, click. Manager, out loud to no one in particular after carefully putting down the receiver. Well, freak you too, buddy. Moral of the story, don't try to intimidate call center staff. It really just doesn't work and you just end up with a recording of you being a jackpot. If given the green light, I would love to just yank debt collectors around on the phone all day. Well, I imagine I probably would get tired of it after a few days of doing that, but still in a bubble, it seems like a fun thing to be able to yank these people around who are just trying to harass people and yank money out of people. And our final story of the day is by Jess underscore Jess9, confess who did it. I, 22 year old female, remembered this story that happened way back when I was attending elementary school. To further specify, I believe it would be like junior high in the US or Great Britain. Sorry, I don't come from an English speaking country. So during the breaks we would be pretty wild, we were around 12, 13 at that time so you can imagine. This incident involved me and one of my best friends to this day, let's call her Kim. During a break, we were making airplanes and balls out of newspaper and throwing that at each other, running around class, screaming, laughing, you can imagine. I mean, we weren't the only two doing it, but let's say we were the most active. The bell rings, we don't have enough time to clean the newspaper up that's all around the classroom, and the teacher, then around late 40s female, shows up. I already finished cleaning bits of newspaper that were in my proximity by the time she walks in. So she sees only Kim trying to clean up the ragged newspaper and starts questioning her. Kim was always a smart butt and a brave rebel. So she claims that she is just cleaning up the mess and she didn't do anything. The teacher doesn't believe her, since Kim had pretty much the reputation of troublemaker, and pressures her to tell her what had happened and who was involved. Otherwise, she will pull up Kim for oral examination. I don't know if this is common anywhere else, but it is super common in elementary schools in my country. Almost all of the teachers do it. It is basically choosing semi-randomly one child each lesson and asking them questions about stuff from last or the last two lessons in front of the entire class. This is supposed to make the children study for each lesson since you never know when it's your turn. But there are some ways you can cheat around it, like if you were last week, you won't be the next week and usually you are pulled from the rotation until everyone gets their turn. Some teachers let students volunteer. In classes where this was possible, we would plan out with classmates who will volunteer next, so you don't have to worry every time and just learn something once. There are also written exams, of course, but those oral exams were always stressful and would usually make half of your final grade. So they are not fun, especially if you are pulled up unprepared. So her lessons are those where you can't volunteer. In fact, even if you wanted to, she wouldn't let you. She said the ones responsible must confess, and she will test us orally if we do. Otherwise, poor Kim here will be the one tested and we should do the right thing and claim responsibility, else she will be the one taking blame. I quickly opened my workbook and confirmed to myself that I know the stuff. I figured if I would confess. I said to the teacher it was my idea and I did it. Not far from the truth. She then makes me do the oral examination instead of Kim and, unsurprisingly, I get an A. In fact, it was very convenient since she basically let me volunteer, which she never does, for something I knew. Plus, then Kim said to me that she wouldn't know much and would probably get a D or an E if she was the one being tested. The teacher had the most sour expression when she wrote A into my grading booklet. The satisfaction of getting A and being pulled from the rotation for the rest of the year is something I remember even today. I would just say if you have a punishment, make sure it's actually a punishment. It's kind of in that oh no vein where it's like go to your room and then you just go to your room and you still have your phone or your PS4 or something. Saying because you did this bad thing you're going to have to do oral examination doesn't work if the person responsible is already well prepared for that oral examination. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today, so if you have a favorite story of the day, let me know in the comments below.
But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing and turning notifications on if you haven't. Both of those things support this channel greatly. So no matter what you did, whether it was just watching the video, liking, subscribing, or having notifications on, thank you all so much for supporting me right here on the Storytime channel. I hope you're all having a wonderful day, and I'll see you all next time.